On May 25, 2008, Northeast Iowa seemed to follow a familiar spring script, warm winds, thick humidity, and a storm watch from the experts. But as the atmosphere stacked risk on risk, what formed was not an ordinary tornado. It was the only EF5 of the year, a mile-wide wedge that swept entire neighborhoods from their foundations and left Parkersburg almost unrecognizable within minutes. What atmospheric ingredients came together so perfectly and so catastrophically to shatter everything that Sunday afternoon? By late May 2008, the central United States was locked in a pattern familiar to meteorologists, but always unsettling. A deep upper-level trough swept across the northern plains, dragging with it a river of warm, moisture-laden air from the Gulf of Mexico. The setup was not subtle. Each day that week, weather maps showed the ingredients building, with pressure falling over the Dakotas, a low forming and tracking east into Minnesota, and a warm front draped north to south across Iowa. South winds at the surface and just above it pumped dew points into the low 70s degrees Fahrenheit, saturating the boundary layer and priming the atmosphere for violent storms. The Storm Prediction Center had been tracking this outbreak for days. By May 25, 2008, their morning outlook painted a broad swath of moderate risk across Iowa and neighboring states. The language was measured but clear. Supercells were likely with the potential for tornadoes, damaging winds, and large hail. Forecasters watched as the prefrontal trough sharpened over north-central Iowa, focusing low-level convergence and setting the stage for explosive thunderstorm development. Satellite imagery revealed gravity waves rippling out ahead of the jet streak, subtle but telling signals that the atmosphere was on a hair trigger. Instability climbed hour by hour. Sun broke through thinning morning clouds, allowing surface temperatures to rise and further destabilize the air. By early afternoon, convective available potential energy soared above 3,500 joules per kilogram, a level that can turn any storm into a monster given the right spark. At the same time, wind profiles showed powerful veering with height, with surface winds from the south, mid-levels from the southwest, and upper levels roaring in from the west. This created deep layer shear, the invisible twist that lets storms rotate and sustain themselves for hours. Iowa sat squarely in the outbreak corridor, with all the classic signatures in place. The moderate risk was not just a line on a map, it was a warning born from decades of pattern recognition and hard-won experience. As the afternoon wore on, the atmosphere over northeast Iowa grew more volatile, each ingredient slotting into place. The stage was set for something rare, and soon ordinary spring risk would tip into disaster. Four ingredients came together over north-central Iowa that afternoon, each one critical, none missing. First, moisture. South winds at the surface and just above funneled air straight from the Gulf of Mexico, pushing dew points into the lower 70s Fahrenheit. The air near the ground was as saturated as it gets for late May in Iowa, heavy, humid, and primed for explosive updrafts. Second, instability. Sunlight broke through thinning clouds, heating the ground and sending surface temperatures soaring. Warm air at the surface sat beneath a layer of much cooler air aloft, creating a deep reservoir of potential energy. By mid-afternoon, convective available potential energy, known as CAPE, had climbed past 3,500 joules per kilogram. That is the kind of number that can turn any thunderstorm into a supercell, given the right trigger. Third, lift. The atmosphere needed a spark to ignite all that energy. A prefrontal trough draped across north-central Iowa provided it, focusing convergence along a subtle boundary. At the same time, a north-to-south warm front edged eastward, acting as a highway for low-level moisture and a magnet for developing storms. Both boundaries worked together, setting up a corridor where air could rise fast and hard enough to break through the cap and unleash towering updrafts. The fourth ingredient was wind shear, the invisible twist. Surface winds blew from the south, but just a few thousand feet up, they veered to the southwest, and higher still, they roared in from the west. This created strong directional and speed shear through the depth of the atmosphere with 0 to 6 km bulk shear values between 40 and 55 knots. That is well into the range for long-lived, rotating supercells. Storm relative helicity a measure of how much spin the wind imparts to updrafts, 
peaked at 200 to 300 square meters per second, squared in the lowest kilometer, enough to sustain a violently rotating storm for hours. Gravity waves rippled across the region, invisible but detectable on satellite, nudging the atmosphere even closer to the tipping point. Every ingredient was in place, each slotting perfectly into the next. The result was not just a supercell, but a storm environment written for something extraordinary, a rare textbook recipe for disaster. At 4.22 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Weather Service issued the first tornado warning for the Parkersburg area. Radar had begun to show a classic supercell signature, a broad rotating updraft with a hook echo curling along its southern flank. Forecasters in Des Moines watched as velocity scans lit up with deepening rotation, the kind that signals a tornado is imminent, not just possible. The warning went out across pages, NOAA radios, and local television, giving residents a window of about 25 minutes before the storm would make contact with the ground. In the minutes that followed, the supercell structure tightened. Satellite imagery revealed a subtle but powerful gravity wave rippling ahead of the storm, a sign the atmosphere was being nudged from above just as the surface boundaries were primed below. At the same time, radar operators noted a descending reflectivity core dropping toward the surface inside the storm. This feature, a concentrated shaft of heavy precipitation and downdraft, often appears just before a tornado forms. It was a red flag to anyone reading the data in real time, the storm was about to unleash something severe. By 4.40 p.m., spotters positioned along rural roads south of Applington began to relay visual reports. Wall clouds were lowering, rapid rotation was visible beneath the base, and there was a sudden ominous darkening as rain wrapped around the mesocyclone. The atmosphere was near its breaking point. Each update from radar and field observers confirmed the threat was escalating, not fading. At 4.48 p.m., the tornado touched down two miles south of Applington, near the Butler and Grundy County line. The initial contact was in open farmland, but early ground surveys would later show cycloidal scarring, tight looping marks in the soil and windrowed debris, hallmarks of a powerful vortex organizing itself. Within moments, the tornado grew wider, transitioning from a slender rope to a wedge nearly half a mile across, aimed directly at the southern edge of Parkersburg. The clock was ticking and the window for escape was closing fast. Forecasters and emergency managers could only watch as radar signatures intensified, knowing the next few minutes would define the fate of an entire community. Just before 5 o'clock, the tornado reached Parkersburg's southern edge. It was already a monstrous wedge, nearly eight-tenths of a mile wide, with wind speeds tearing through at an estimated 205 miles per hour. In the span of a few minutes, entire neighborhoods were flattened. Homes built to modern code and anchored with steel bolts vanished, leaving only bare concrete and splintered rebar where families had lived. Some foundations showed snapped anchor bolts, others had rebar sheared in half, evidence of forces that overwhelmed even the strongest construction standards. The destruction was systematic. Blocks of houses disappeared down to basements, their contents scattered or gone. Trees that had shaded yards for generations were stripped of bark and branches, reduced to raw, jagged trunks. Cars and trucks were tossed and mangled, some hurled hundreds of yards from where they had been parked. Where streets had once connected the community, only a debris field remained. Wood, insulation, bricks, and fragments of everyday life ground into the mud. Applington Parkersburg High School, a symbol of the town's pride, took a direct hit. Reinforced concrete light poles around the field were snapped and dragged. Brick walls failed at their weakest points, and entire sections of the building collapsed or were peeled away. Two banks in town were destroyed or heavily damaged. In one, a security camera recorded the tornado's arrival, capturing the final seconds before the power cut out, an unblinking record of the storm's violence. A large metal frame industrial building, under conversion to a church, was obliterated. Steel beams twisted, torn from their footings, and piled in a heap yards from where they had stood. This was not just destruction, it was erasure. Textbook EF5 damage, confirmed by engineering surveys and National Weather Service teams, who found nothing left above ground but slabs and scattered debris. In all, nearly 300 homes in Parkersburg were damaged or destroyed, 
with later analysis counting over 600 affected. The tornado did not discriminate. New builds, old farmhouses, businesses, and public buildings all fell in the same relentless sweep. For those who survived, the only way to know where a house once stood was by the shape of a foundation or a familiar tree stump left behind. The very layout of the town was rewritten in minutes, the scale of devastation clear in every direction. East of Parkersburg, the tornado showed no sign of weakening. It tore across open farmland, flattening groves and leaving deep scars in the soil, cycloidal marks that traced the passage of a force few would ever witness. South of Highway 57, the pavement itself was ripped away in places, peeled up and tossed aside as if it were nothing more than carpet. Fences vanished, grain bins crumpled, and fields were littered with splinters and mangled metal. As the storm approached New Hartford, it widened again, nearly matching its Parkersburg breadth. A housing development on the north side took a direct hit. Several homes, anchored to their foundations and built to modern standards, were swept away entirely. In one case, the tornado scoured the basement so completely that even heavy appliances and personal belongings disappeared, an outcome almost never seen and a grim confirmation of EF5 strength. Vehicles were thrown and twisted beyond recognition, their frames wrapped around what little remained of trees or fence posts. Residents who sheltered underground emerged to find their neighborhoods erased. For some, even the contents of their basements were gone, leaving only bare concrete and a blank horizon. East of town, the tornado pressed on, carving a corridor of destruction through rural Blackhawk County. Near Dunkerton, it briefly widened to nearly 1.2 miles, battering farms and leaving behind a landscape stripped of landmarks. By 5.58 p.m., after more than 40 miles, the tornado finally lifted southwest of Fairbank, its path marked by nothing but silence and ruin. Sirens faded, but the roar of the storm was replaced by something quieter and more urgent, the sound of survivors calling out from the rubble and the first responders moving in. Streets that had been neighborhoods only minutes before were now a maze of splintered lumber and shattered memories. Emergency crews, volunteer firefighters, and off-duty police began arriving almost immediately, weaving through debris where street signs and landmarks no longer existed. With power lines down and roads blocked, paramedics set up field triage sites on any patch of open ground they could find. They worked by hand and flashlight, treating wounds, splinting broken bones, and improvising stretches from doors and siding. In those first hours, the numbers became painfully clear. Nine people had lost their lives, seven in Parkersburg and two near New Hartford. Around 70 more were injured, some seriously, many pulled from collapsed basements or buried under the remains of their homes. The scale of the disaster could have meant far more casualties, but the quick work of first responders and neighbors limited the toll. Leadership came from every corner, but one figure stood out. E.D. Thomas, the longtime Applington Parkersburg High School football coach, was among the first to move through the wreckage, checking on students, helping clear debris, and organizing volunteers. In the days that followed, Thomas became a rallying point, urging the town not just to count its losses, but to find strength in each other. His presence brought a sense of order and hope amid the chaos, reminding everyone that the spirit of Parkersburg was not lost, even when almost everything else had been. Engineering teams arrived in Parkersburg within hours, notebooks and cameras in hand, searching for answers in the ruins. Their surveys revealed not just loss, but a forensic record of what happens when nature outpaces design. Of the 621 homes affected along the tornado path, 394 were destroyed outright, many reduced to bare concrete or empty basements, even when anchored with bolts and reinforced with rebar. In several cases, investigators found snapped steel rods and anchor bolts bent or sheared, evidence of wind loads far beyond what any building code anticipated. One home foundation still held twisted rebar snapped clean. That was twisted proof that even reinforced concrete could not withstand the uplift and lateral forces measured that day. The numbers told a stark story. Damage estimates reached $75 million in 2008 dollars with the true cost climbing higher when accounting for lost businesses, public buildings, and infrastructure. The tornado's violence was not contained to Parkersburg. 
debris from homes and businesses, roof shingles, family photos, even official documents, was recovered over 100 miles away in Wisconsin, carried aloft by updrafts, and deposited far beyond the storm's visible path. Engineering reports documented how some homes built to code and properly anchored were swept away as if they had never existed. In New Hartford, a well-built house lost not only its walls, but the contents of its basement, stripped bare by suction and wind. Those failures sparked debate among engineers. Could any above-ground structure truly withstand 200 miles per hour winds? The consensus drawn from the evidence in Parkersburg was sobering. Modern codes can reduce risk, but at EF5 intensity, only below-ground shelters offer reliable protection. For every slab left behind, the lesson was clear. Sometimes the best engineering is knowing when to get below ground. Today, nearly two decades later, Parkersburg's scars remain visible from the air and in building codes across the Midwest. As extreme weather grows more frequent, the lessons from this enhanced Fujita rating of five shape every warning siren and shelter plan. The next storm will come. Whether we're ready depends on how deeply we remember what a single tornado can erase. Share your thoughts below.